Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, you know, all of our friends and family for being here for Daddy's service, and and thank you for uh, for sharing in, his, in the celebration of his life. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the people that are here today to honor my daddy, and thank you so much for getting us here safely. Father, I ask that you would help today to replace our pain and sorrow with sadness and sadness with joy, joy in the great stories and memories of daddy that, will always, that we will always have on our hearts to share with others. Father, I also ask that as Sydney shares your word with us, that uh, you'll open our hearts and minds to receive it and to apply it in our lives. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Jack Trout, age 82, formerly of Athens, Texas, passed away March 2nd, 2018 in Allen, Texas. Jack was born December 13th, 1935 in Boswell, Oklahoma to William Irvin and Lois Hazel Neal Trout. He married Gloria Annette Mason on March 12th, 1955 in Leveland, Texas. Jack retired from El Paso Natural Gas after 33 years. He is survived by his wife, Annette Trout, formerly of Athens, Texas. Children, Richard Wayne Trout of McKinney, Paula Colleen Freimeyer and husband Sydney of Crane, Texas, and Susan Elaine McKinney and husband Mike of Lucas, Texas. Grandchildren, Tyler Trout and wife Casey of Lubbock, Texas, Cami Rutledge and husband Seth of Anna, Texas, Ryan Trout and wife Kristen of Midland, Texas, Carly Trout of McKinney, Christy Nelson and husband Steve of Callisburg, Texas, Kayla Lowry and husband Ross of Edmond, Oklahoma, Kelsey Barrels and husband Seth of Gainesville, Texas, Curtis Freimeyer and wife Lindsay of Midland, Coleman McKinney of Euless, Texas, Lexi Wadley and husband Bryce of Allen, Texas, Carson McKinney of McKinney, Julia McKinney and Jack, and Jack McKinney of Allen, Texas, or Lucas, Texas, great-grandchildren Leo, Everly, Shamara, Kyrie, Nathan, Braden, Lucas, Harper, Hannah, Bo, Logan, Rowan, and Layton, and sister Dorothy Whitmire of Copen, Oklahoma. He was preceded in death by his siblings, Billy, Neil, Janine, Colleen, Nelson, and Gay. So today I want to talk about of course, when life comes our way, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So we all know one of these days we're going to cross that bridge, and we're going to enter into, uh, hopefully, eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jack had done that, and that's what I want to share today, the victory that we have in Jesus what we have to look forward to when we do go to heaven, and how, how Christ is preparing a place for each one of us even now. And that, that's our hope in Jesus Christ. I want to read John 14, 1 through 6. And it's a very familiar verse and chapter there of Jesus comforting his disciples before of his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's always been comforting to me to go back to this in any life situation because it gives you hope. We know that there's hope in Jesus Christ. And so as we read it today, and then we'll touch on it, go back through it. But in John 14, 1 through 6, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then there's always one like Sidney or Thomas that says, Lord, how do we know the way and where are you going? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. I like this verse because it's always, it's always been a favorite of mine. Uh, uh, you know, I guess early in life, there are certain scriptures in the Bible that you memorize and it's, it's just been a part of your life. And this is one of them for me because it's very, very comforting. 
You know, as, Jesus, as you can imagine, Jesus sitting with his disciples and knowing what was going to happen to him. It's all part of God's plan. And he's knowing what it is. So he was comforting his disciples at this time. And he was telling them, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And so you know that was troubling them in their mind. Where are you going? Where's this place going to be? But I like the first of it. It says, do not be troubled. In other words, do not be troubled. Trust God. Jesus is telling them, trust God, because I'm going to be with the Father. And so as it goes on, Christ speaks of heaven as a real place. And it is a real place for us, the, those that are in Christ Jesus. It's a real place. Heaven is a place for prepared people. And you've got to be prepared to go to heaven. And that's what Christ has done. You know, and, and, and Christ, as he prepared this place for us, and, and, we, and we think about it, if Christ, all part of God's plans, if Christ never had went to the cross, he never had died, he never would have risen and ascended with the Father, there wouldn't be no heaven. Because he'd still be on, here on earth, Right? And so it's all part of his perfect plan in life. As if Christ died for each one of us so that we might have the abundant life. Jesus said, I have come that I might have life and might have it more abundantly. And that's our hope. But there's only one way there, and that's what this scripture talks about. It's through Jesus Christ. You have to go through the cross. And that's, that's comforting to me because one of these days... If you're in Christ Jesus, you're going to get to go to heaven. We're going to get to see Jack again. That's very comforting in a time like this. And, and again, you might ask, well, well, how does one know that they're going to be a part of heaven? How does one know that they can go to heaven? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says in John 10, 28 and 29, He says, And I give unto the eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He said, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no one is ever to take them out of my Father's hand. Once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, there's no looking back. There's none of it. It can't be taken away from you. And that's what that verse talks about. And that's a comfort we have in the Scriptures today. And each one of us has to come to that place in our life, though to turn away from sin and turn back to God. That's what repentance is. is just turning your life in the opposite direction and coming back to God. Does it mean that we're going to live a perfect, sinless life? No, it don't. You know, Jack wasn't a perfect person. I'm not a perfect person. None of us in this room are perfect. To, to, to walk the Christian walk is a daily struggle. And anybody who tells you it's not, they're probably not telling you the truth. The Christian way of life is a daily struggle. We all have sin in our life. We live in the flesh. We live in a world that is full of sin all around us. And it's not getting any better, as we all know. So it just encourages me that each one of us must hold on to Jesus. And in one of these days, we'll get to enter that place with him. Another one of my favorite scriptures are, it talks about, it talks about the new creation it says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In other words, what that's saying, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have new values and new motives in your life. You don't want to do the same old things you used to do. God changes your heart, and when he changes your heart, you have different directions in life that you want to go. And that's so important. I want to talk to you today a little bit about Jack's life and, and part of his testimony. And, um, because I, I think it's so interesting to talk about a changed life. And that's what I want to do today with Jack's testimony. And just tell you a little bit about one of mine and his conversations that we had probably 20 plus years ago. But we all know, and we're not going to deny it, that Jack suffered with alcohol addiction for years. And the neat story of, of it is, is that he changed. 
But the neatest thing is, how did he change? So one night in Rio Doso, me and him was up there working on the house. And, and uh, so I asked Jack. I said, Jack, it's just me and him on the front porch. I said, what's the difference? What, what made you change in your life? And he said, Sidney, he said, I had a lot of unforgiveness in my heart. And he said, I had to deal with a bunch of things from my childhood. And he said, once going through, and uh, let me back up just a little bit, but he told me that, but Jack drove himself to treatment center in El Paso, Texas, because he realizes that he needed to change. And that was the first step of it. But he, but he told me, once I got there, and I started going through the program, I realized that there was unforgiveness in my heart. I realized that something was missing in my life. And he said through AA and through this treatment center, he said they helped me realize that I had to, un first of all, forgive people. So he said I had to write some letters to some people, even though some of them were already gone, and ask them to forgive me. And he said that's what I did. But he said, he said the, the, the greatest thing that I did was realize that I couldn't do it on my own. And I had to have Jesus Christ to help me. I'll, I'll never forget that night. Because if any of you knows Jack, when he's serious, he's serious. And he was very serious with me that night. You know, and, and one of the qualities of Jack was that he always, always, always looked at the good in all people. He always looked at the good in people. And I thought, what a quality of life that he just accepted people as they were. And this, this was before he even turned his life totally over to the Lord. I'll tell you a few, few stories that there was a, at one point, Jack and Annette ran a flyer shop for years and they had an old van that they used at the flyer shop and they were gonna sell it. And a couple come by that had two disabled boys that needed that van. They were going to put a lift on it. They needed it for their kids. What did Jack do? He sold it to them for a dollar. That's the kind of man he was. And then, you know, Jack, he could give looks, and you knew to either be quiet or just move on. <laughs> and I got a lot of those looks. Me and Jack built four houses together. And so I got to know Jack really well, and I knew when it was time for me to shut up and put up and just do what he told me to do. And so uh, I think Curtis said the other day, he said, Pawpaw's the only one that could call me a dumbass, and I still felt loved. <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, that's really, that's how Jack was. I mean, he may, he may get right in the big middle of you, but you never doubted his love for you. Never, ever. You know, and after, after Jack come back from treatment center, and, and I'm telling you folks, it was, it was a remarkable turnaround in his life. And Jack got involved in AA. And first he just started going, and then Jack became a counselor and a mentor to a lot of AA people. And, you know, one day we were, I think we were on Garden Street in Crossbad, and Jack said, Sidney, I'll be back in a little bit. I'm going to go to AA meeting. I said, Jack, you mind if I go with you? I said, I've never been to AA meeting. I, want, I just want to see what it's about. And so he said, no, come on. So I went to AA meeting with Jack, and it was an eye-opener to me 
not only to see people in the room struggling, but to see Jack helping them. Because he had been through those struggles. And who knew the right words to say? And there was others in there too. But Jack and a good friend of his, Al, was one of the biggest contributors to that meeting that day. And I thought, man, this is, this is so out of character for Jack Trout. This is so out of character because Jack was, never was real sociable. He might, there might be 30 people in his living room. And where's Jack? He back there watching TV asleep on the couch. He wasn't mad at nobody. It's just when he got ready to go to bed, he went to bed. And the, bed, and the couch was his bed for many years. But that's just the kind of, kind of person he was. I want everybody to stand just in honor of Jack. And let's read this together. This is, this is the serenity prayer of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, Jack lived by this. And I, I think it'd be a tribute to him if we read it today. Okay. God grant me the serenity to things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. You can be seated. But Jack, Jack lived by that quote. There were certain things in life that he knew that was out of his control that he couldn't change them. But the things that he could change, he would. But he learned to accept them and to know the difference between. You know, I remember when Rick told him after he came out of surgery a couple of days later, Rick told him, said, Dad, they found some cancer. And what was his words, Rick? I'm not going to worry about it. That's just the type of person he was. It was out of his control. Sure, we're all concerned about it. But Jack knew that his hands and his life belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he couldn't worry about it. He knew he was a winner either way. If he got to stay here on earth, he is a winner. If he got to go to heaven, he is a winner. So that's the kind of philosophy that he had. I want to read one other scripture. And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13, I'm sorry. 4 through 8. We've all heard this scripture, but... As you, as you listen to this, just think of how many characters that Jack Trout had in this scripture. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love will never fail. And when you think about Jack, you think about that. So many characters there that he had that love always builds people up. What a lesson to each one of us. Love always builds people up. And it don't matter where you're at. I've seen Jack so many times. He would care for the underdog. That's the type of person he was. He cared for people. But especially for that underdog, you better believe Jack Trout was going to be on their, their team and be fighting for him. And then this is the lesson that love never fails. It always builds up. So I think about all this today and, and Jack's, as we celebrate his life and, and, and the things that he went through and what a changed man and what a changed life it was. I think about what would Jack want to say to each one of us? The first thing I think he would say, he used to tell me all the time when we was building houses, you can do it. You can do it. Because I was green when we first started. He used to always tell me, you can do it. So he would, he would want us to change if we need to. To repent and turn to God. That would be his, his prayer. Is that each one of us change and turn to God. When I was in the hospital with him, when all of them were having Meemaw's birthday party that day, I stayed with, with Jack. And, and if you're watching TV with Jack, he's always in control of that remote. 
It don't matter if he's sick or what. He's in control. But we'd watch sports for a minute, and then we'd watch someone preach. And we'd go back to sports, and we'd go back to preaching. But I, I, as I just sat and observed him, you know, you could tell he was tuned in on the Word of God. He listened reverently to the Word of God. And so, talking about watching TV with him and stuff, we watched a lot of baseball. He loved the Los Angeles Dodgers. I told Paula if I'd have thought about it, I'd got me a Dodgers hat and wore it today during the service because he was a Dodgers fan. But when you're watching baseball with Jack, you wasn't watching one game. He was watching multiple games. And we was jumping back and forth between games. And another thing Jack I think would want to want to say to us is don't miss out on heaven because it's real. If Jack wanted to right now, he wouldn't. It, it, even if he could, he wouldn't come back to us. Because he's got a new home and a new place. He's got one of those mansions. And as I looked at this the other day, I thought it was kind of funny because I thought of it. And I thought, it's like, yeah, and he's probably telling somebody how to build those mansions. Because he could do it. Jack was a, was a handyman in anything. But I, I, know, I know that he would say, don't miss out on heaven. And the last thing he'd say, I'm not, I'm not gone. I'm only temporary away from you. You'll get to see me again. Thank you all.
I think we had a few that would like to come and share a memory of, of uh, Papa Jack. And so if anybody's got a memory now that they would like to come, and I'd ask you to come to the mic because they are recording and then we'd like to get it on recording. So if anybody's got a memory now, then now's the time to, to come. I got through that prayer without getting emotional, but I may not make it through this one. But. Anyway, one of my favorite stories I was telling Carly, I think it was yesterday, was uh, I know there's some of you El Paso natural gas camp rats out there. But anyway, I was raised in plant number three. They're about four or five miles uh, north of Jal, New Mexico. And we had these big old uh, elm trees like most of the camps did, you know, branches six, seven inches, you know, and you could climb way up in the top of them, you know, without falling in this. You know, it's, it's said that those tr trouts, they run like they hate the ground, you know, and they don't climb trees much better. Anyway, I'm, I've got me and my buddies are getting ready to, to climb this tree and I, uh, t you know, take first shot at it and boy, I'm, as long as I'm looking up, I'm doing great, you know. I climb way up in the top of the tree Felt like I was up there 30, 40 feet. I'm sure it was only 10 or 12. But anyway, I got up there, and then when I looked down, I knew. I knew, uh oh, you know, I'm not, uh, I kind of vapor locked it. I'm not going to be able to get down out of this tree, you know. And I told my buddies, I said, y'all uh, going to have to go get my daddy, you know, come help me. And uh, it wasn't just a little bit, you know, I saw him coming down that sidewalk, that Jack Trout swagger. You know, and I knew I'm probably in trouble. I'm probably in trouble, but it's going to be okay, you know. And uh, sure enough, he got up there and he saw me in the top of that tree and he shook his head. He had his hands on his hip and he said, boy, get your butt down out of that tree, you know. And, and I mean, I, I climbed out of that tree with professional expertise, man. There was no, there was no issues uh, climbing up that climbing down that tree like I climbed up it, you know, but just knowing that he was there, you know, I knew if I fell, you know, he's going to catch me. But, uh, you know, he's, uh, was my protector then and, 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 you know, was my hero, but, you know, loved him to pieces. Yeah, 
I'm not as good as Rick or Sid for that matter. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to make it through this without crying, but I don't have a funny story to tell, but I just want to say how proud I am to be Jack Trout's son-in-law. I'm proud to be a part of his family. He was the ultimate family man. I mean, you can tell through these pictures and everyone sitting out here, that was the most important thing to Jack. I'm proud to have known him. I wish I'd have known him a lot longer. I've seen those looks, that dumbass look, you know, but I still felt loved. Never did I feel not wanted from Jack. I'll miss him saying when I walk in the door, well, there's Mike. He made you feel special. He was a good man and he lived a good life. And I've got somebody, his namesake, in my family. And I'm proud that he's got that name. I'm going to cheat <laughs> and read something I wrote um, after Paul Ball passed. Uh, Last time I got to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Paul Ball, my aunts and I had spent all day at the hospital, and they were tired. <laughs> so I went and sat with him and thought about this. It's a common statement in my family for someone to say, oh, trouts are good sitters. It's usually a half-baked excuse for why we're late, Susan, <clears throat> or still on our PJs in the middle of the afternoon, or simply why we just aren't interested in participating in your plans, Dad. <laughs> we just want to sit. To my mima, sitting's practically a crime. And as understanding and patient as Seth is, my husband, or all the other in-laws, Sid, Mike, Steve, Ross, all of you who've married in, know. <clears throat> it's hard to wrap your mind around the amount of time a trout just wants to spend on our backsides. It's an observation of my mom's side of the family, and it was quite perplexing to them too. But many trouts know a good sit is often what we need. Our Papa Jack did a lot of his living that way. As those pictures showed, he sat and held a lot of grandchildren, 13 of us and 13 great-grandchildren, and made silly sounds and faces, just hoping for a giggle. He was always proud when he got one. He told my mom once that that was God's second chance for him. As my uncle Sid shared, he was a changed man in our lifetime. He spent a lot of time sitting in the captain's seat of Meemaw's boat. She was always sure to claim total ownership. She sure as heck wasn't pulling it out of a boat slip. <laughs> he sat for hours on end on his and Meemaw's back porch, watching the lakes rise and fall with rains, worrying about whether one of us was gonna break something or hurt ourselves, playing around on their dock, looking up birds or nosing on the neighbors, which he always claimed was Meemaw's fault, or reading the paper and just sipping coffee, as you saw in the picture. He had an office chair that was good for sitting and looking up his Dodger stats or playing a few hands of free sale. And if you'd sit and listen to his stories, he'd sit for hours, telling you about beating up his cousin Thomas or taking a beating from his cousin Thomas or the time they lit their treehouse on fire just to see if everyone could make it out alive. He'd sit for miles and miles on the back of a, or he'd sit for miles and miles in the seat of his Suburban with a half of a cigarette in his mouth and Meemaw giving him bad directions. He'd show up for our baseball games or track meets or golf tournaments or weddings, holidays and graduations. Always liked being the center of attention when he, once he got there. In his lifetime, before my memories really take hold of him, he spent time sitting on the bar stool. It was a demon he walked away from and never looked back on. I can barely recall how grouchy he used to be all the time when we were younger. But that all changed when he came to live with us in the mid-90s. He came to help my parents build their dream home and ended up spending a little over a year with us. 
I think that's the season where he really learned to appreciate that second chance God had given him. I hope my brother will share some stories about that too in a minute. My sister, barely a toddler at the time, knew that Paw Jack was going to sit on our back porch and smoke smokerettes, as she called them. She told him, whatever he did, don't put those smokerettes in my mama's flower bed. He told her to go get somewhere and shut up. <laughs> and even before, when Papa was just a boy, he dropped out of school. He and one of his, friend, one of his brothers had, had it in their heads they were not going to go back. Instead, Papa decided to go to the lumber yard and st- sit and smoke cigarettes all day. He'd watch all the work crews load up their load for the day, and he'd follow the biggest load out. And then he'd sit and watch them work all day long. When their work was done, he'd walk through and observe everything there was to see, teaching himself how to build damn near anything uh, out of a load of lumber. As good as he was at sitting, church and school sitting never were comfortable for him, but yet he was full of faith and full of knowledge. And today, he sits with his maker. His body is whole again. And his mind is sharp. And he'll wait on my Mima just like he has since, they were, since he was 19 years old. And we'll sit with her like we are today. And we'll remember not to force life to go any faster than it has to. And to learn what we can from what's right in front of us. And to find a patience we never quite have grasped before. And of course, to never miss an opportunity to give someone some well-deserved grief, which we all received from time to time. I told my dad, uh, we spent some time together, uh, right before Papa had his last surgery. And my dad was, you know, voicing some sadness, um, maybe a fear of being selfish, uh, that Papa spent so much time with us when he was helping build that house. And I told him that I was thankful it took so long. Uh, Because of that, we all have a relationship. All of us grandkids have a relationship uh, with him that we wouldn't have had before. We spent a lot of time breaking down some of those walls. Uh, And I I don't even remember that season before all that love we had for our Papa Jack. Well, like Cammie said, uh, Papa, he lived at that house on Denison with us for, felt like, Felt like about third through sixth grade, but I think it was more like a year and a half. But uh, we uh, we used to give him a hard time too. I think that was a luxury we enjoyed more than Dad did, because he uh, he wasn't he wasn't uh, nearly as much of a disciplinarian to us as he what he had to be for Dad. But uh, we gave him a hard time about wearing a hole in our in our uh, living room floor because from where he slept every night. And you could see right where his bed was. And he'd tell you, we'd be watching wrestling or something. He'd tell you, all right, y'all, go, y'all get out of my room. I'm, I'm going to bed. It's time for bed. And we would. We'd, we'd give him a hard time, and then we would. But uh, there's one time me and Tyler were, uh, Tyler and myself were daring each other to mess with, with Papa while he was taking a nap, which was pretty brave, very brave thing. And, Finally, he conned me into doing it somehow, and he said, "I, right, I give you, I give you a twenty or something if you uh, if you get one of his hairs off his head." And I thought, "Dude, give me that, that's not even possible, you know." And so I'm like inching up there. Here I'm going real slow, like man, I'm looking back, and he's he's urging me on, being my big brother, you know. He's always talking me into doing something I shouldn't do, you know, stupid, and. Uh, I get up there, and I get a hold of it, and it just fell out. And I was like, "Sweet, you know." And I don't even think he even he knew he noticed, you know. But uh, that was I look back at Tyler, and he's, you know, he can't believe it. But uh, so I got a little bit of, you know, I got a little bit of credit for that, which shouldn't have. Uh, there was a time uh, that house we built over on Augusta, or y'all built, Papa built. Uh, Tyler and I were always helping here and there, and it was during the framing, and he was going through with a nail gun, and he was pretty, he was pretty good, you know. He was going fast, and he had his foot right there in the way. Me and Tyler are watching him like, okay, he's doing this and doing that, kind of learning from him, and he gets one, two, three nails, and there's a fourth one, and it just went right through his foot, and and it nailed the stud and everything, and 
Me and Tyler look at each other like there's going to be like stitches, an ambulance maybe. You know, we're, we're thinking hopefully, you know, when one of us be passed out up there, you know. And Papa just kicked, it, kicked the stud off his foot, you know, and he just, just kept on nailing. And I think about 20 minutes later he took a break and took it out with some pliers like, what's the big deal? And me and Tyler nearly fell out over that. You know, we, his, his a tough son of a gun to us. So, uh, but uh, I hear this one. I wasn't there for this one, but this was uh, one of my favorite ones to hear Papa tell. And I know a lot of y'all heard it, but uh, their cousin Thomas came. He was talking about used to spend some time with them in, in Oklahoma at their house for the summer. And uh, he and Melson, I think they kind of initiated him a little bit. Uh, I think they, they kind of helped him along and uh, at one point they were in bed you know cutting up and their mother kept telling them to be quiet y'all be quiet I'm gonna come in there y'all better be quiet and uh, I guess they they made Thomas sleep in the middle you know and they kept being loud and being loud and well here in a minute she came in there with a switch and she was laying into him well Papa rolled off one side Uncle Melson rolled off the other and she was just going to town on Cousin Thomas there, and of course they kept they. Yeah, they held him down. Yeah, and they just no, Mama, please, no, no, you know. And she's they wouldn't they was under there giggling, you know. But that was the kind of thing I think. Papa never he never grew out of that because he he did that all the way up. To the end there, and uh, some of my fondest memories was with Curtis and Meemaw and Papa. We. Uh, We'd spend a week or two, and our parents would call and say, y'all ready to come home? And we'd say, me and Curtis kind of look around. Me and Ma would have something in the oven probably. or said, no, nah, I think we're doing all right. You know, y'all getting homesick or are you missing us? Said, yeah, I miss y'all, but we're, we're good for now, you know. I think that happened just most of the summer, you know. We, we spent a lot of time, but Papa never was big on pole fishing, or at least he wasn't, but he always – took Curtis and me and me all fishing, you know, and he would always make it the, the most fun he could for us, you know, and that, that was something that, uh, that just kind of embodied the way he was is he didn't really, he didn't really care if, if it was something he wanted to do or if, uh, you know, if, if it was good for him on his terms, but if, if it meant something to you, then he was always, it was a it was a no brainer for him just to go out of his way to help you and or to or to make things more fun for you or or uh, teach you a lesson. Lots of wisdom too. So I just want to share those with you. <laughs> I got to spend a lot of time with my Mima and Papa when I was younger. I would spend summers with them while my Mima was running a flower shop and spend most of the days with Papa. And I had him wrapped around my finger. We watched. Toy Story five times over in one day, and I'd go and press rewind on the thing, and I would just press play, and we'd watch it all over again. He called me Buzz, because I was obsessed with Buzz Lightyear. He bought me every poster and cup and anything we could find inside the store that had to do with Buzz Lightyear. Meanwhile, would make pancakes in the morning, and one time uh, she had put the syrup in the fridge, and you know, four-year-old Lexi didn't like the syrup in the fridge, and she didn't like it heated up in the microwave, so Papa would say, damn it, Lexi, and he'd go to the store and buy me a new bottle of syrup. <laughs> Similar story to that is uh, I loved my Cheerios. Everyone knew that as a, as a kid. I would eat Cheerios all the time. And one time he took me to the grocery store and he let me run up and down the aisle and pick, my, uh, pick out a new cereal that I wanted to try, something with a cool box or a toy or something. And we went home, he poured me a bowl, put some milk in it, took one bite, and I said, well, I don't like this. And he said, well, damn it, Lexi, and he took me back to the store, and we went and got some Cheerios. <laughs> and that's just who Papa was to me. He always spoiled me, and he always took care of me. I sat with him at AA meetings, and I would sit in a room full of men smoking cigarettes, and I just sat there, and I had no idea what was going on, but those were my memories of being with Papa. And it's something I'll never forget, and I'm just really grateful that I got to have him as my grandfather. First off, uh, I want to say about Jack is he's the inspiration to my dad that put him in AA 35 years ago. Both of them been through a lot of stuff together. But he was the inspiration 
I wasn't around him a whole lot, except for the time they let us move into their house with them. For six, eight weeks, whatever it was, seemed like for months and months. But they welcomed my whole family into their house. That's the main thing I want to say. And after seeing your whole family, Annette and Jack, y'all have a beautiful, talented family. And thank you for allowing my family to be part of yours. Thank you. I've only known Jack for the last six months. Uh, they moved into the Ivy where I live with uh, them in the same area, in the same place. But I want you to know that I have come to know this family so well that I feel like I've known them my whole life. They um, actually have adopted me into their family. And I love them very much. And I have to tell you, I watched Jack love his wife, Annette. in such a special way. <clears throat> I want to tell the story that I want to share with you. We get flowers at the uh, IV every Sunday, and uh, Annette takes them into the apartment, and here's Jack sitting in his chair, and he watches every move she makes. Anything she does with those flowers, he's got every eye on his beautiful wife, Annette. And then, I think Paula has a story she could share with you about at the hospital when he asked her to turn around. He wanted to see his wife as he laid there in the hospital. But this was Jack. Jack was a good man. It's a wonderful family, and I'm so proud to be part of it. And I want to thank you for having me with you today. Thank you. God bless. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just uh, we want to thank you for, for being uh, such a wonderful, all-knowing God that, uh, that you bless us with such special relationships and, uh, and family and friends. And, and uh, just thank you for the experiences and the times and the life that we were able to share with, with Papa Jack. And, uh, and just thank you for all the, the wonderful examples and lessons and laughs and uh, and so on that that we were able to to have with him lord that we that we cherished and uh, that we didn't take for granted while he was here lord and just uh we just want to welcome him to you to you lord and uh and we're going to miss him here but we we know that he's doing he's doing all right up there with you god and, and we just thank you for for sending your son down here to die on the cross for us, Lord, and just we just want to thank you for that, and thank you for for all the many blessings that you that you pour upon our family, Lord, and just uh, we we want to ask these things in Jesus' name, Amen.